Hello, everyone, and welcome to the American Society of Criminology's webinar on progressive prosecution. My name is Christopher Coper, and I am joined in hosting this webinar by Cynthia Lum. We're both professors at George Mason University Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy, which is a center of the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society at George Mason. Cynthia and I are the Editors-in-Chief of Criminology and Public Policy, the flagship policy journal of the American Society of Criminology, which is currently managed here at George Mason. Criminology and Public Policy is a high-impact journal that publishes empirical research that examines justice policies and practices to inform criminal justice decision-making. We want to welcome and thank the more than 450 people from around the world who registered for this webinar and who represent hundreds of organizations. We encourage all of you to look at the journal online and consider joining the American Society of Criminology. We will send information on how to do that in a follow-up email after today's presentation. And I'll also note that members of the ASC get free access to criminology and public policy. Our webinar today highlights the issue of progressive prosecution, which is a movement for criminal justice change and reform that has been adopted by some jurisdictions in the United States through the election of prosecutors who emphasize reducing incarceration as well as racial and ethnic disparities in the justice system. In practice, progressive prosecutors seek to promote these goals by reducing the prosecution of lower level offenses, seeking fewer prison sentences, supporting bail reform, undertaking efforts to reduce bias in decision-making and other reforms. Against the backdrop of sharply rising violence in the United States, this approach has become a prominent and controversial topic in public discourse on crime and justice. Recently, Criminology and Public Policy published two articles written by two of today's guests that evaluated the impacts of progressive prosecution on criminal justice processing outcomes and public safety in different parts of the country. Their studies highlight some of the potential benefits and drawbacks with this philosophy. Our webinar today highlights these articles and their implications in an effort to inform public dialogue and evidence-based and bring an evidence-based perspective to this issue. We hope that this discussion will inform practitioners policymakers, scholars, and the public as they seek to balance concerns about fairness and equity in the criminal justice system with those of public safety. For the introduction of our guests, I'll now turn things over to Cynthia Lum. Hey, thanks so much, Chris, and welcome everyone to uh, the webinar today. I have the pleasure of introducing our three guests that we have with us who I am so thankful uh, could join us for this webinar. Uh, we're first joined by Professor Ojemar Mitchell from the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. Professor Mitchell's research and justice uh, policy expertise includes drug control, sentencing and corrections, and racial fairness in the criminal justice system. He has served as an advisor to the U.S. Department of Justice's Science Advisory Board, New York City's Pretrial Research Advisory Council, and Philadelphia's Pretrial Reform Advisory Council, just to name a few. Uh, he's the recipient of the prestigious National Institute of Justice's W.E.B. Du Bois Scholarship to study prosecutorial decision-making and case processing in Florida, the topic of his paper that was recently published with colleagues in criminology and public policy, which we're going to be discussing today. Mr. Tom Hogan, also joining us, is currently a PhD student studying criminology at the University of Cambridge. However, before that, he has enjoyed a long legal career in the private sector, focusing on white collar criminal defense, and also as a local and federal prosecutor. Mr. Hogan was an elected district attorney for Chester County, Pennsylvania from 2012 to 2020, and he received his law degree from the University of Virginia. Recently, also his master's in criminology from the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed the study that was recently published in Criminology and Public Policy that he will be discussing today. And last but certainly not least is uh, my friend David Laban. Mr. Laban is president and chief executive officer of the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. It's a national association representing elected and deputy or assistant prosecutors and also city attorneys. The APA serves as a global forum for the exchange of ideas, allowing prosecutors to collaborate 
with other criminal justice partners and conducts training and technical assistance to improve the prosecutorial function. I especially appreciate him being here today as I would imagine that the views of prosecutors around the idea of progressive prosecution are varied. And given that APA represents prosecutors of all uh, types across the political spectrum, David, I look forward to your thoughts about this. Um, before we begin, let me reiterate Chris's comments by saying that neither the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy nor Criminology and Public Policy take a political position on this topic. We are interested in the contributions that research and science can bring to our knowledge about courts and sentencing. This is why we believe an open forum to, dis to discuss these two re research studies is so important, and we look forward to all of your questions, the audience as well. Uh, just a reminder, if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A. And as always, we strongly encourage civil and professional questions and debates. So to start, we've asked Professor Mitchell and Mr. Hogan to each briefly review their studies, followed by commentary by Mr. Levant. We'll then engage in a discussion of this issue facilitated by Chris and myself, and then pose the questions by the audience to our panel. So Professor Mitchell, I'll turn the screen over to you. Thank you. Give me one moment to get my PowerPoint presentation pulled up. And here we go. Good morning. Thank you everyone for joining us. I've been asked to briefly summarize our recent paper published in Criminology and Public Policy entitled, Are Progressive Chief Prosecutors Effective in Reducing Prison Use and Cumulative Racial Ethnic Disadvantage? Evans from Florida. This study was written by Daniel, Daniela Ormas Mora, Tracy Sitko, and Dr. Lindsay Bonjus, with some assistance from myself. This research was made possible by a grant from the National Institute of Justice, so I want to thank NIJ for their support. This study is relatively straightforward. It was motivated by our interest in the growing progressive prosecutor movement that's been occurring across the United States, at least in 60 or so jurisdictions, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. These progressive prosecutors have campaigned on platforms that call for the reduced use of prison as a means to reducing uh, mass incarceration. And they have also campaigned on platforms that call for greater racial fairness. Given these platforms, we wanted to empirically assess whether progressive prosecutors are effective in achieving these goals, which leads to two questions. Are there systematic differences in case outcomes by type of chief prosecutor, progressive versus conventional? And question two, are racial ethnic disadvantages smaller in jurisdictions with progressive prosecutors? All of this is going to occur, our study is going to occur in Florida, and notably, Florida's court system is organized into 20 judicial districts or circuits, and each has its own elected state attorney or chief prosecutor. These state attorneys have tremendous power over case processing and case outcomes. These powers include uh, the authority to hire, train, supervise line prosecutors. They establish policies and practices that guide the tr tremendous discretion of line prosecutors among many other discretionary powers. For time considerations, I won't get into the weedy details of case processing in Florida, but I do wanna point out there are three substantive stages in the process. The first stage is the complaint. In this stage, the initial charges are filed in collaboration with police. Bail's determined largely by the judge, in the second stage, the information stage, prosecutors decide whether charges will be filed as a felony. Keep in mind all the, all the charges that we're going to be looking at today were initially filed as felony. So this information stage decides whether the char charge or the case will continue as a felony, or will it be reduced to a misdemeanor, diverted from prosecution, or dismissed entirely. This stage is actually quite formative because if a prosecutor decides to file a charge as a felony, Defendants are almost certainly to be convicted of a, of a criminal charge. It's almost 100%, just a little bit less than that. The third stage is the adjudication stage. Here's where the plea negotiations uh, begin. And those plea negotiations actually specify the type and length of a sentence. 
So for example, there's a court document, the plea agreement that lists the, the agreed upon sanction type and sanction length. Notably, adjudication can be withheld, meaning that the defendant can be found guilty, but the that conviction can be held in abeyance until uh, a probation term essentially has been served. What you see across all these three substantive stages of case processing is prosecutors have tremendous control over uh, what happens in the case, including the sentence. One key feature of Florida courts that makes this research possible is that court records are publicly available on the internet via the, the clerk of the court websites. These websites document and make available the documents that, that detail all three stages of case processing and outcomes. So what I'm showing you here is a complaint. I've redacted the person's name, but the records themselves have all this information. The, the only thing that's not uh, redacted, well, that is redacted is the social security number. So this case involved possession of a controlled substance. This is a felony. This is one of the most common felonies in the state of Florida. This gentleman is homeless. He was caught with 0.8 grams of spice and that led to his, his arrest on a felony. This is the complaint stage. At the information stage, the prosecutor in this case decided to continue to pursue these charges as a felony uh, controlled substance case. They did so by filing this felony information that you see here. And the third stage, the defendant was found guilty of this charge and sentenced to 15 months in federal, excuse me, and Florida uh, prison based on possession of 0.8 grams of spice. Notably, the prosecutor in this particular district is known as a traditional law and for order prosecutor, which leads me to wonder whether the same case filed across uh, the bridge in a different county would have received the same type of sentence. That sets the stage for what we're going to see here. And before I move forward, I want to talk about those three substantive stages. If you think about the three substantive stages I just mentioned, it leads to seven common case outcomes. The first and least punitive case outcome is dismissal. The whole case is dismissed. This is actually quite common. Second outcome is transferring a felony court to a lower court. This is a misdemeanor court, traffic court. Third, diversion from prosecution. Fourth, adjudication being withheld. Probation, jail, and prison. This is the approach we're going to rely on, this cumulative case outcome approach, to see how progressive prosecution, race, ethnicity affect case outcomes across all the seven of these stages. To answer our questions, we drew a simple random sample, 5% of, of cases filed in 65 counties. There are actually 67 counties in Florida, but two small counties don't make their records available, so we, we had to exclude them. As I mentioned, all these, these records were publicly available. One of the things that we did is we matched or we linked each defendant uh, to DOC records that we have that also publicly available to obtain their criminal history. So between these sources, we were able to see what happened in each case, and we were able to see all the criminal history convictions in felony court uh, going back for years for a sample of almost 12,000 defendants, or really cases. The key independent variable for this research is whether or not a case was adjudicated in a jurisdiction headed by a progressive state attorney. There is very little empirical research that is endeavored to measure who is in fact a progressive state attorney. What we did is we were guided by the existing thought on this issue and we came up with a classification system that relied on four factors. The use of smart or data-driven policymaking, the establishment of a conviction integrity unit, non-prosecution or diversion of a whole class of offenses. For example, another common felony offense is driving on a suspended license or revoked license. This is, can be a felony if, if it's occurred, uh, I think it's three or more times. 
And some prosecutors have decided they weren't going to prosecute these cases as felonies, they were diverted or non-prosecuted. Fourth, removing poverty traps. This is an umbrella term for policies that uh, restrict the use or oppose the use of cash bail or do things like reinstate driver's license based on non-financial conditions. Based on these criteria, we found four progressive state attorneys and 16 conventional or traditional state attorneys. Key question, of course, is whether case outcomes differ by the type of state attorney. Turning to the results, what we see in regards to our first question is there are some important differences between progressive and conventional state attorneys, cases handled in their jurisdictions. Cases handled in progressive jurisdictions were more likely to have their, their case dismissed, transferred, or diverted. None of these individual differences are statistically significant, but if you combine them and take their complement to figure out which proportion of cases were adjudicated guilty in a felony court, what you find is cases adjudicated in progressive jurisdictions are less likely to end up with a felony conviction. That is the first key finding. The second key finding on this point is on the far right of the screen, you will see there's a statistically significant difference in the probability of being sentenced to prison in a progressive jurisdiction in comparison to similar cases in a conventional jurisdiction. Uh, in particular, it's about a five percentage point difference in the likelihood of being convicted of a felony, excuse me, of a, of a crime that leads to a prison sentence. In regards to the second question about racial and ethnic disparities, we find very little evidence of Hispanic disadvantage in either conventional jurisdictions. What you will see here is Hispanic and whites receive roughly comparable outcomes at each of the seven case processing stages displayed here. And in progressive jurisdictions, there also are is not evidence of Hispanic disadvantage. In fact, one could argue that Hispanics are advantaged in the sense that their cases are somewhat more likely to be dismissed. That's on the, on the bottom left. And on the bottom right, you see that Hispanics are also somewhat less likely to receive a prison sentence than whites. We do, however, find racial disparities, racial dis disadvantage, and case outcomes, at least in conventional jurisdictions. The key finding here is in conventional jurisdictions, African Americans are less likely to receive probation and more likely to receive prison sentences than comparable whites. But in progressive jurisdictions, there is no evidence of Black disadvantage. Again, in progressive jurisdictions, minorities here African Americans are more likely to have their cases dismissed. There's still a difference in probation. African Americans are less likely to uh, receive probation, but this difference is in, it's cut in half in comparison to conventional jurisdictions. And the, comp the probability of receiving a prison sentence is comparable between whites and blacks. There's no difference there. So in summary, our key findings are progressive prosecutors are more likely to resolve cases without uh, resorting to a felony conviction relative to conventional or traditional state attorneys. And Black disadvantages in prison was not evident in jurisdictions with progressive state attorneys, and the disadvantage in probation was narrowed. I didn't mention here that there is little evidence of disparity or racial ethnic disadvantage for Hispanics. So with that, I'll end my presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Mitchell. I we're going to hold questions until the end, but um, somebody raised the questions very quick, uh, which is, did you code these manually by reading the PDFs and entering them, or was there a way to automate it? If that if there's not a quick answer to this, we'll hold there's that. A quick discussion. answer. We read through each and every one of them, in part because some of the documents are written by hand. I didn't show that, but I, we, we we couldn't find uh, scraping that had that capability. And also we thought scraping would violate the terms of the, the website's uh, user provisions. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mitchell. Uh, Mr. Hogan, we'll, we'll turn to you next. Thank you. What an incredibly interesting time to be studying crime because people are doing things that they've never been allowed to do before. I mean, five years ago, if somebody would have said, let's shut down a six block square block area of a major city, 
and not allow the police in and see what happens, I'm pretty sure your institutional review board would have censored you and the government officials probably would have moved to commit you. But it happened in Seattle and two researchers got to measure those effects and published it in CPP. It's really interesting time to be doing this. So what I was interested in measuring was, and this really builds off of what OJ did, uh, which is measuring deprosecution and the potential impact on homicides in Philadelphia. So let me share my screen here. All right. So what is deprosecution, first of all? Deprosecution is the discretionary decision by prosecutors not to bring charges regardless of the evidence, not to convict regardless of the evidence. And OJ did a very nice job of describing the power of district attorneys, prosecutors to do that. Um, so even if you have the ability to convict somebody beyond a reasonable doubt, it's a decision that I'm just not going to do it. It's interesting because it's an asymmetrical power in the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system, the rules of criminal procedure, the constitution are set up to constrain an overly aggressive prosecutor. There is nothing in the rules of criminal procedure or the constitution that in any way constrains the power of a prosecutor not to prosecute, to de-prosecute a case. So a very, very powerful tool for a progressive prosecutor. Now, why did I choose to look at Philadelphia for this? Really two reasons. Um, the first is Philadelphia elected a prosecutor, Larry Krasner, who ran very explicitly on a campaign of de-prosecution. He said, look, I'm going to charge a lot fewer people with a lot fewer crimes. So he was very explicit about it. And at the same time, homicides were going up in Philadelphia. So it sort of leads to a natural question of, is there a relationship between deprosecution and homicides? It also was a great chance to test an equation that's always been in the back of my head for criminal justice. And when I think of this, this is sort of the universal equation for criminal justice. And this is how I think of it. It's police times prosecutor times judge plus X. X is a very small number. And that gives you your criminal justice result. And for you economists out there, let police, prosecutor, and judge all be equal to or less than 10. Let X be less than or equal to one. And let the criminal justice result be 1,001. Now let's go back to high school math. If police, prosecutor, or judge, if any one of them go to zero, then the whole equation basically goes to zero. So this was an interesting way to look at this question and say, is this equation actually accurate? Is the entire criminal justice system, the parts of it that we can control, actually that sensitive to police, prosecutor, and judge impacts? If police go to zero, then prosecutor and judge don't matter. If prosecutor goes to zero, police and judge don't matter. If judge goes to zero, police and prosecutor don't matter. So it was an interesting thought process that led to this investigation. So where do we start whenever we start looking at a question like this? We start with descriptive data, right? So we had to dig into first, is deprosecution actually occurring in Philadelphia? That was our first question and what's going on with homicides. And I'll tell you right now, there were two very clear surprises in the data that we pulled up and I'll show it to you now. So here's a chart that shows Philadelphia's new cases and sentencing. And I will, let me say up front, I excluded 2020 and 2021 for two reasons. One, those data weren't available when I started this uh, investigation. And two, with COVID-19 and the, and the George Floyd killing, I had no interest in getting that aberrational data mixed up in here at this point in a very preliminary study. So we look at sentencing and new cases coming into the system. And I know somebody's gonna say, well, new cases coming into the system, which is up here, um, that's up to the police. In Philadelphia, it's not. There is a charging unit that the DA's office runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And every police arrest in Philadelphia goes through the charging unit. And the prosecutors in the charging unit will say, yes, you can go forward or no, you can't, or the charges have to be amended. And OJ did a nice job pointing out in Florida how it works. Um, but in Philadelphia, there is a similar way 
that the prosecutors are controlling the intake of new cases. And then we also measured new sentencings. Sentencings was what really interested me because sentencings express the full discretion of a prosecutor over the course of the entire investigation, of course, the entire prosecution. And as OJ measured the same thing, he's measuring prosecution sentencing outcomes. So, but there are two surprises in here, right? Larry Krasner is elected in and takes office in 2018. And if you look at this chart, you will see that the casings and sentencings are already going down very quickly. 2014 looks like it's about a spike, and then it's going down pretty significantly and consistently. So our first surprise is deprosecution started before Larry Krasner took office. So again, we're measuring here a policy, not a person, but a policy. And deprosecution started before he took office. Now, the second surprise was District Attorney Krasner said, look, I'm going to deprosecute low-level misdemeanors. Um, and we checked. He did. Retail theft went down. DUI went down. Possession of small amounts of marijuana went down. Simple possession, which in Pennsylvania is strictly a misdemeanor, all went down. Um, but we saw some surprises in here as well when we checked the felonies. Because look at the drug trafficking felonies. What is possession with intent to distribute in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania? Huge downward reduction in the number of new sentencings. Other felonies, robberies went down, burglaries went down, VUFA, which is generally felons in possession of firearms, went down. So our big surprises here were that one, deprosecution started before District Attorney Krasner was elected, and two, Deprosecution, at least in Philadelphia, covers a wide degree of felonies and misdemeanors. And if you look back at the sentencing chart, it actually was a 70% reduction in sentencing between 2014 and 2019, the last year we measured. So we have a 70% reduction in sentencing covering felonies and misdemeanors. Meanwhile, what's going on with homicides? Well, homicides are going up. Uh, this was no surprise. This was going on in Philadelphia. It's, it's been noted. And actually, I just got the 2020 numbers, by the way, for uh, new cases. So I added those in and let sentencing run out to, or the uh, homicides run out to 2020. But you see homicides starting with 2015, when we're looking at deprosecution beginning, beginning to rise and rise and rise. And they're moving in an inverse relationship to the new prosecutions and the sentencing. Well, what's going on in the background in Philadelphia? Everything else is pretty static. Income is pretty stable. It's slightly increasing year by year during this time period, but it's not changing by much. Uh, population, not changing by very much. Stable, increasing by small increments. The Democratic Party is firmly in control of the city. Um, and this is really important. There are no viral events in Philadelphia. There is no George Floyd. Uh, there is no Laquan McDonald. Uh, so this really makes Philadelphia sort of the perfect place to study for deprosecution because the confounders are missing from in there. We have a stable static background. So to summarize, we've got a 70% reduction in sentencing across felonies and misdemeanors, and homicides are increasing fairly quickly and in the, against a stable background. The question then is, all right, is there a causal relationship? And how are we going to measure that? And that'll get us into our methodology here. Now, what I used in order to measure this was the synthetic control method. And because I know we have some people who are non-statisticians, non-academics on the call on this webinar, let me take a second just to simply describe synthetic controls. Back in the old days, if we were gonna compare Philadelphia's homicide results um, and see if there was a causal relationship with deprosecution. We just would have picked two other cities and said, all right, we're going to compare these other cities. And that led to a lot of arguments about are those cities exactly alike or not? There was a famous study about uh, the gun laws in Washington, D.C., where they control, compared Northern Virginia and the suburbs of Maryland. And it resulted in a huge pillow fight between the academics about whether or not that was valid. So what we really would like is we'd like an identical twin city to Philadelphia, right? We'd like to have the exact same city. 
we'll just put it on the other side of the Delaware where Camden is now. Same population, the exact same people, exact same crime, everything exactly alike, an identical twin. The only difference would be that in 2015, we would not have deprosecution beginning. We would keep up normal levels of prosecution. And then we could look at that identical twin and make a causal estimate about the differences between prosecution, deprosecution, and homicides. That's what synthetic controls does. I mean, enter Alberto Abadi, a professor who's now at MIT, who said, hold my beer, I can do this. What we'll take is we'll take all of the units that you're using, in this case, cities, but he said states, countries, whatever it is, and use standard variables for all of them. And I will create an algorithm that will create the identical twin to whatever it is you are studying. And then you will be able to estimate what the difference is between what your causal outcome is. So there's a very simple description of what we're doing here. So we took the synthetic control algorithm and we're using Philadelphia as our treatment city. And we used the other 99 largest cities in the United States and dumped in standard variables. Homicides, obviously, population, median income, clearances for homicides. And we had to classify the prosecutors. And as OJ pointed out, and as Dave will talk about more, classifying what is a de-prosecuting prosecutor or a progressive prosecutor is very hard. Um, I actually went through and created a 15 point checklist and you had to qualify in nine out of the 15 points to be classified as a progressive de-prosecuting prosecutor. And then there was a middle category um, that didn't fit any category. And then there was a traditional category that was more or less the photographic negative of progressive prosecutors. But that acted as both a variable and to exclude 16 cities um, as potentially being de-prosecuting cities from the synthetic control analysis. Now, I have to tell you, I spent three or four months manually going through everything to code all of these cities. And at the end of that time, came up with the exact same 16 cities that everybody is classifying as progressive or deprosecuting. It wasn't a waste of time, uh, but it was enormous uh, time spent in order to do that. So what's our results though for the synthetic controls? What's the comparison between the identical twin, synthetic Philadelphia and real Philadelphia? Here's what we're looking at, all right? So we have a match for the pre-period 2010 through 2015. And that's what the synthetic control tries to do. It tries to match it through the combination of cities. And then once you get out to 2015, you start to see a divergence. And it really picks up by 2016 and it takes off by the time you get to 2017. And what you're seeing there is by the time you get to 2019, 2000 and 19 has about 200 some homicides, maybe 210, 215 in Philadelphia. That is what the algorithm is estimating should have happened in Philadelphia without the prosecution. In real Philadelphia, what's happening is you have over 350 homicides. So we're looking at a pretty big difference between the two. Now, the synthetic controls also allows you to plot Philadelphia against all the other cities and we'll see what the homicide differential is. And that's what that plot looks like. Philadelphia is the red line. All of the non-progressive cities are the gray lines. And you see, once again, Philadelphia taking off, moving above and beyond the non-progressive cities for the homicide differential, what's expected in the number of homicides. Now, a neat point that was suggested uh, by a colleague was, well, test Philadelphia against the other progressive cities. So we did. Now this statistically doesn't have much power because there are only 16 cities involved against Philadelphia. But you notice Philadelphia actually starts out below the other progressive cities and then takes off and slowly joins the other progressive cities in the homicide differential. So it's interesting what that synthetic control algorithm is telling us. Um, it's telling us that deprosecutions associated with a change in the homicides in Philadelphia. But what we're really looking at here is what's the bottom line number? What are we talking about? What's the big picture number? Big picture number here is for homicides, an additional 74.79 homicides per year in Philadelphia associated with deprosecution. That is a lot of extra homicides over that five-year period 
2015 to 2019, when deprosecution is going on, we are seeing over 300 extra homicides in the city. And it's interesting, the algorithm matches up what's going on in real life in the city as homicides are going through the roof in Philadelphia. They're not going down, they're not flat. The algorithm is predicting very accurately what's going on in Philadelphia. Now the p-value is 0 0.012. For a study like this in the social sciences, we're looking at a, a p-value of 0 0.05 or less for statistical significance. And we do have statistical significance here. For those of you who are not statisticians, think of the p-value as measuring the chance, uh, the odds that all of these results are just happened by random chance. And in this case, that would be 1.2% that these results are just generated by random chance. So we're at the 95% confidence level. We're pretty close to the 99% confidence level. And this was a two-sided test as phrased in the investigation. Um, so if we phrase it as a one-sided test, which we certainly could have, we'd be at the 99% confidence level. Now, that's a pretty big result. Um, it happens because Philly homicides were going up, but also because the algorithm was predicting Philly homicides, but for deprosecution, should have kept going down, which is the direction they were moving in before deprosecution started. And I've also got to point out, 74.79, it's not just a number. Those are people. Those are sons and brothers and fathers and children. And for those of you who are race and poverty scholars, 85% of those victims in Philadelphia are black. And almost all of those victims come from the poorest neighborhoods in Philadelphia. So what is happening in Philadelphia is heavily concentrated on the most disadvantaged communities in Philadelphia. Now, at this point, we generally talk about robustness testing, and I will just simply summarize it by saying every which way we cut this, every different methodology we tried, we sent this off into showing the same trend, a large increase in homicides in Philadelphia associated with deprosecution. Uh, there was an independent group of researchers who assembled the data on their own um, and replicated this, came up with 74 homicides and a p-value of 0.012. So replication has been achieved. The mechanisms are fascinating. Maybe we'll get into that in the discussions. Uh, I recommend you read the article about that. Um, but the, this is criminology and public policy. So what are the big policy takeaways from a result like this? And I'll suggest three. Tom, and the first- Tom, let me just uh, interrupt you just for a second. Um, I wanna get make sure we have enough time for questions and things like that. Uh, so let me just ask if you could wrap up um, briefly. Sure. Absolutely. So three points uh, to wrap up. First is, this is a voter's choice. The progressive prosecutors ran explicitly on a program on a platform of deprosecution, and they are delivering deprosecution. So it's up to the voters. Uh, we live in a representative democracy. The other point is, well, the voters will have to take into account the impact on homicides. Second point is, there are budgetary constraints. If there are 70% fewer sentencing, then that will trickle down into the number of prosecutors, the number of public defenders, the number of judges. Third point is we're looking for the prosecutorial sweet spot here. Where is the point where prosecutors can maintain control over homicides while not becoming a draconian police state? And that's really the million dollar question here. And the one as I handed over to Dave LeVon is the one that prosecutors struggle with every year. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation over to Dave. And uh, Dave, I, um, I'm sure, by the way, for those who are asking questions, um, and if you see your question being moved to be answered, it's not because it's been answered, it's because we're just recording it and we will ask those questions for you uh, uh, when we open it up for the audience round. Um, but Dave, I, I'd like to get your reaction to these two papers. Um, and in, in some ways, as you know, Chris made uh, mentioned in the setup, um, there are reasons why we have uh, a press prosecution. We're trying to keep people out of jail. We're trying to reduce disparity in our criminal justice system. And as Tom mentions, uh, there can be uh, consequences to this, uh, some that can be serious. Um, I'd like to hear from you just from a practitioner's perspective on the ground with prosecutors who span this 
uh, the thinking around this. Um, what did they think about these issues? What do you think? And what's your reaction to these two papers? Well, well, Cynthia, that's that's a, a a massive kind of why why and how kind of question. Um, it's it because we have three thousand separate systems of justice, and very much like OJ said, one side of the river might be one office, another side of the river might be another office. An exact same case in our country could go in two different directions, and that's been the system we've had um, since since the inception, and we like a bottom-up rather than a top-down justice system. Working with a lot of other uh, countries, they are they cannot believe that the U.S. Attorney General cannot phone a, a, a local prosecutor or a local police chief or sheriff and direct that person to uh, arrest and incarcerate. And, and that being the end of the question, because on the top-down model, that's how that works. We don't have it. We, we have a representative democracy and we have a bottom-up approach and that's why I think these two papers are fabulous. Um, OJ's paper looks at the, the effect of the prosecutor on the individual or on the individual case and um, points out very well the, 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 the standards and the basis upon what an office is doing very much affects that ultimate outcome. And, and why did this all start? Why do we have this quote progressive prosecutor movement was over incarceration um, to punitive a system, and then most importantly for our country, the significant racial and ethnic disparities. And I will also say on, on behalf of the justice system or the criminal legal system, there's no other system that tests itself the way the justice system does. And not only that, and, and being proud to work with prosecutors, not only do you test it, but you do something about it. And that, again, is what OJ's paper points out. Look, there are, you look at drug paraphernalia, you look at low level cases, and what is the effect on the community if you prosecute those cases? Then it's fascinating to juxtapose uh, uh, Tom's uh, study, because like, well, well, wait a second. Um, when you do that, what is the effect on the community? What, what is the effect of, of those um, and their lives and ultimately, can those decisions and can that change, can the public pronouncement that the office is not going to prosecute the following cases, which since it was really 2016 was was a significant change um, in, in really the role of the prosecutor. And, and Cynthia, as you know, I've been at this at, at association state and national level for 25 years. I've worked with thousands of elected prosecutors, and I know everybody uh, talked about in the study personally and, and worked with, with many of their offices. Uh, and so this is, it's very easy to talk about the personality and the reasons why those individuals ran to be the elected prosecutor and what, if anything, was the effect. So there we end up with, okay, they ran for a purpose and they, they accomplished that purpose. At the same time, longitudinally, could, could there be something else? And, and when you look at, 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 at Tom's study, that goes back to Seth Williams. Same thing with Philadelphia. We've worked with that office for a long time. Uh, my dear friend Baziki was talking there about, uh, you know, filing. You know, what percentage of cases do you file? And I'm going to spend just, just a few seconds saying this study is unusual that all five of the offices involved have the ability to make a filing decision. Because many, many other offices in this country, it's not the prosecutor who makes the filing decision. It's the police. And then it's punted to the prosecutor. And that point, you have to either dismiss it or move forward. Again, we've got so many different systems, and many times different systems within systems. Dave, you're, uh, we're receiving some static on your end. If you could turn off your video, I think that might help with you coming through with your response. Okay. While Dave is, um, is trying to come back, I, I definitely want to 
going to stay on a topic that he had mentioned and and OJ and Tom, I'd like to engage with you a little bit on this topic while we while we wait for Dave to um, to come back to us. Uh, uh, Dave, if you can hear me. Um, okay, there he goes. Uh, well, Tom and OJ, I'd like to ask you a question that he raises uh, because I think it's really at the heart of of this issue. You know, um, in the American criminal justice system, the equity is so important. We're trying to achieve it. Um, uh, we, we, are not, we aren't always successful, and sometimes we do a poor job of it. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to achieve safety, right? Um, and, and control of crime, especially serious crimes, um, in which it provides great harm to our communities. How do we achieve both? Um, because both of you kind of talk about, uh, you know, this this challenge, that's the crux of the problem in some ways, right? Putting aside the politics, I guess, uh, how do we achieve both? Um, is strategic targeting the answer? Are there viable alternatives uh, that we may be able to look towards in achieving both equity and safety? And OJ, I guess I wanna start with you um, about this question and just hear your thoughts about this because it seems like, um, the crux of our problem. Well, I'll say that I think the data-driven approach, the smart approach to prosecution is a key mechanism to achieving both goals. You can uh, control crime without blowing up the system in terms of just mindlessly charging and prosecuting and, and sentencing uh, individuals. In contrast to Tom's paper, what we find in Florida and, and other research is Progressive prosecutors and conventional traditional prosecutors have similar crime rates. So it shows to me that their approach has achieved all the major goals of prosecution, public safety, equity, and justice. That's the approach I think it would be wise to adopt. Whether you're progressive or traditional, you can adopt a data-driven approach. And Tom, uh, Dave, we'll get back to you in a second. Tom? I think I would focus on the fact first that equity has a two-sided coin. It is equity for both the defendants and equity for the victims. Sometimes that gets lost along the way. Um, but I think Cynthia's question really drives home something I've been thinking about a lot and have been thinking about a lot for a long time. To me, it really relies on three things. Uh, if you wanna maintain equity while maintaining crime control, first, you've gotta focus on crime concentration. We know that we only have to go after really hard 5% of the violent offenders um, in order to control violent crime. It's a very narrow cohort. Um, second, I think we need to do a better job defining of what violent crime is. Right now, we all agree retail theft and, and possession of small amounts of marijuana are, are, are nonviolent offenses. We agree that homicide and uh, non-fatal shootings and rape are violent offenses. But there is some room in the middle where people are not really clear. Um, for instance, I think possession with intent to distribute drug trafficking and, um, and weapons offenses, felons in possession of firearm, those are violent adjacent offenses. Um, and we've got to think about that fact because those offenses really do drive homicides and non-fatal shootings. They are one moment away from being a violent crime. And I know Chris's research shows a lot of that as well. Um, and then the third point is vertical prosecution. This is massively underexplored. If you pair up prosecutors and police to work together more closely, and we're seeing that. I mean, a charging unit is one way of doing that. But for a homicide or a non-fatal shooting, put the prosecutors and the police together right away. You will get a better investigation. You will minimize errors. And you will be laser focused on the most violent offenders. Make sure they get swift, certain, and severe sanctions. You put those three things together, and you can have a very narrow criminal justice process that still controls crime. Hey, thanks, Tom. Uh, Dave, I want to return to you. Sorry about the technical issues that you're having. Um, we uh, just went ahead and kind of focused on this issue of equity and crime control. But did you want to continue or wrap up what you might were talking about? Sure. And thank goodness for iPhones. Um, <laughs> but 
where I was going was you've, you've got so many different systems of justice. You've got systems within systems, things even within states that are, that are different. And I think the movement towards progressive prosecutors, and I think the only thing that the two studies don't don't agree on is whether or not Kathy Rundle, whether uh, the 11th uh, Judicial uh, Circuit in, in Florida, whether she's a progressive prosecutor or not. I, I think that that's interesting. Uh, the 15 point test versus the four point test. Um, but I think what you look at is, is that frustration. I think OJ's paper points it out he is an incremental approach or in Tom's model, the difference between progressive and traditional, he ended up with uh, some offices in the middle is, is an incremental approach to criminal justice. The, the ones that, that, that work, or do we have to do this, uh, you know, elect folks who say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to stop public pronouncements of what they are or not going to do. I think what's significant here is if you look at, at two of the Florida prosecutors uh, involved in the study, one chose not to uh, run again, and, and she and the governor ended up uh, in, in, and we have published decision about non-prosecution as it relates to her homicide cases, where Governor Stott, Scott took from State's Attorney Ayala all of her murder cases uh, on the issue of, of the death penalty. And then most recently and very publicly, uh, Governor DeSantis has, has removed Andrew and, and all over the issue of uh, signing statements, committing not to prosecute cases. So this is very public. This is um, an issue that's going to continue to roll forward and does very much affect the, the profession of prosecutors. What is the prosecutorial discretion? This paper talks about it being vast, or OJ's paper especially. It's vast only in the, in the deprosecution. It's not vast in the once you present the case, because once you present the case, the court, the defense, uh, the juries, they, they have control of it. So th thank you. I, I hope that that was helpful. But this is an evolving issue. And even as we've been working on this webinar, um, that this issue continues to evolve. And I think there are some questions, both the role of the prosecutor as well as the ethics of the prosecutor, uh, because the cases we're talking about here are not cases where there's no evidence. That's a very easy ethical question. It's instead cases there's evidence a crime was committed, and but what's the appropriate thing to do about it? So with that, hand back the time. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, before we turn things over to audience questions, uh, we have uh, one other uh, question that Cynthia and I would like to raise for uh, Tom and OJ. And that is, what do we need from a data and research standpoint to try to make prosecution more evidence-based so that it can achieve this balance between crime control and equity? And I guess, uh, Tom, maybe I'll start with, with you first on this question. Well, I have three things, I think, Chris. One, we've got to open up the black box of prosecutor data. Um, it was a huge pain trying to pull all this data together, and we're still drawing inferences from it. We need to know at each point along the way, how many cases do prosecutors take in? How many do they decline? Once they get them in, how many do they actually get through a preliminary hearing? Was the reason they got it through the preliminary hearing because it, witnesses didn't show up, or what was the reason? How many cases do they get all the way through to the to sentencing, what got dropped along the way and why. There are just a million decision points in there that we need to be able to quantify. Second thing is we need to do controlled experiments. Right now we have prosecutors that are either doing the same thing they've always done or prosecutors that are doing 18 different things at once. It's very hard to isolate one thing. Um, the police data has largely been driven by RCTs um, and we need to do some of those controlling for everything else with prosecutors. And the third thing is we really need to educate the researchers, which is the folks who do this research need to understand the criminal justice system. You can't just be an economist, go in and jump right into the criminal justice system. It's a very nuanced system. So my suggestion to everybody is when you're publishing in this field, and OJ did it nicely, is get somebody who has been in the system um, to be a co-author with you to look at the data and to suggest to you, here are alternative explanations, or this might explain the whole thing, or you're really onto something. Um, and I know there are plenty of people out there willing to do that. Great, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, OJ, let me uh, hand that question off to you as well. In addition to the three things Tom pointed out, I would have three additional things. 
the first one is we not we, we don't we need not only data on case processing statistics and so we can see what prosecutors are doing. But one of my frustrations is we can see the decisions that case uh, processors and prosecutors are making, but we don't know why. Why was a case dismissed, right? I only found one jurisdiction that consistently listed why they reached the decisions. I think that's the vital missing component. Second, we need more uh, information on the policies and practices and the structure of prosecutors' offices. We, we don't really know that right now. And in terms of research, one of the things we, we didn't talk about in this paper and we haven't published yet is interviewing and talking to prosecutors, talking to individuals in the criminal justice system. I really think we need mixed methods and qualitative research on these issues to get a more nuanced understanding of prosecution. Great, thank you. Uh, also, I, I guess another question I might throw out to you, we just have maybe a minute or so before we'll go to audience questions, but uh, it seems to me that because the term progressive prosecutor is still kind of imprecise, there might be some room here for looking at, or maybe there is, for looking at variations in what progressive prosecutors are doing uh, across different jurisdictions, perhaps, and, and trying to relate those to you know, some of these different outcomes you've been examining. Uh, and another thought too is I, I sometimes wonder too about the community angle uh, and exploring uh, community perceptions of, of these changes in policy and how they're being received. But uh, I don't know if either you had any uh, immediate thoughts about those issues. Well, I'll jump in first. What you're talking about relates to what I was saying about prosecutor offices needing to be more public about their policies and practices. They are elected officials, but the public has very little idea of what they're doing, right? That's why we need data. That's why we need policies and practices. And of course, if we had more information on policies and practices, we would have a more nuanced understanding of whether a prosecutor is in fact progressive, traditional, or somewhere in between. I'll turn over the rest to Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of this is media driven um, in the fact that if you say progressive prosecutor, depending on where you are in the country, different things come to mind. If you say it on the East Coast, you obviously think of Larry Krasner. You say it in the Midwest, you think of Kim Fox. You say it on the West Coast, you think of George Gascon and, and Chesa Boudin. Um, so it's interesting that those are the leading um, people that people think of. They can be very different from some of the other progressive prosecutors. Um, so we really need to dig down into what are the differences. If people are deprosecuting, who's deprosecuting misdemeanors as opposed to who's deprosecuting felonies, which is a pretty big difference, but we really need to sort of have gradations within that and not just lump everybody into one category, much like we lump everybody into being Republicans or Democrats and there are huge differences within that. Great, thanks very much. So uh, Cynthia, I think now we're gonna get into some audience questions. Yeah, yes. Chris. And, oh, go I'm ahead, sorry. Dave, Dave please. sorry. I was wondering if, there, if I could jump on that because, because of the title. And, and that's where the title progressive prosecutor has been around a lot longer than 2016 to present. Uh, 2016 to present was, was a time when in election strategies, there became a, a platform that particular uh, folks ran on. But that title has been bounced around, uh, at least here in DC, uh, 2007, six, seven, eight, uh, probably during the, the recession at that point. Uh, of offices doing things differently. And as Tom talked about it, many of them were done for fiscal reasons, and especially because the offices could not hire and could end, end uh, crushing back backlogs, which is where we're at today. I think the bigger question is, is not, is it a progressive prosecutor, but how does the prosecutor, the chief prosecutor look at their role? Are they the ministers of justice? Meaning that they have this global responsibility or are they case processors? In other words, doing very excellent work on what they receive because prosecutors generally are on the receiving end and some of them even don't even get to file the, their cases, but they, they do good work with what they receive and they try to get good outcomes on those pieces. So I think that piece is out there. I think the political issue right now, and, and Chris, I think you used the phrase of community. It used to be the police prosecutor relationship had that broken down, what was happening there, especially with police use of force cases. That was the initial flashpoint. But now I think what you've seen is it, it, it has expanded out into the community and it's, and it's involved now the mayors and the governors. As, as Tom 
was was mentioning different offices. It is highly unusual, but it is now occurring. One of the prosecutors we're talking about here was was suspended by the governor. Suspended by the governor. How extraordinary is that as far as the voting people? Uh, but but how many different mayors and governors are in their elections and races pointing to the prosecutor as being the cause of of the the, the spike in crime? And um, there are at least two governors that are running that if they get elected, can't gubernatorial candidates, they will their day one they will fire the chief prosecutor in the largest jurisdictions in their state. So this is an extraordinary thing. And I, I, don't, I don't think titles uh, serve it well. I think it's more a function and role. Okay, thank you, Dave, and all uh, for your uh, responses. I, I'd like to turn to the audience questions. There are many. Um, and what I'd like to do is if there are repeat questions by the same person, I'm gonna try to um, get to more variety of different people who are asking questions and also group some questions together. So my apologies to all if I fail to do, do this very well. Um, but the first question, I think, Tom, uh, goes to you, uh, which is um, a question is by focusing on one place and choosing a synthetic control model. Uh, this individual says you set aside the data and information on 96 other places where you could have coded the prosecutor but didn't end up in your study. Can you say more about why you did that and also why 2010 was the starting point? And if, if all of you can focus on short answers, we can get to more questions. Uh, sure. Um, I, I always used to say if there's a, an answer that is longer than 30 seconds long, then it's, I'll talk to you about it afterwards. So 2010 was chosen as a starting point. First, intuitively, I had a five-year post period constrained by 2020 and 2021. So intuitively, I was picking a five-year pre-period. Um, in addition to that fact, um, I had the fact that Seth Williams started in 2010, which gave me a nice clean comparison between two prosecutorial regimes without having to go back into an entirely different prosecutorial world. And then if you wander even further back, we're always concerned about other confounders in both the pre and the post period. Well, if you go back just a little bit into the pre period into 2008, 2009, major recession, um, which could be causing variations across the country in the entire synthetic control. And then you keep going back and you run into 9-11. Um, so major recession, 9-11, um, both of those things could cause major problems. Um, I did look at um, some going back further and the, the trend remains the same. Large increases, um, it, it is somewhat time sensitive, um, but you're getting large increases associated with the prosecution throughout that time range. And it's generally statistically significant um, going all the way across that time range. It starts to fall off a little bit if you go way out, um, but it's pretty consistent on the results. Um, the other question was uh, basically the sophistication of the synthetic control model. This is an early model, folks. This is, we are just beginning to tap into this. Um, what I would have really wanted would have been from all 99 prosecutors, exact data on their deprosecution strategy, their level of new cases allowed into the system, their level of sentencing, so that I could really drill down and create a synthetic control model that had all of that data in it. Um, that's the holy grail that we're looking for here. And when we were talking about what are some things that we're looking for going forward, that's opening up the black box. That's exactly what I'm looking for here. Thank you, Tom. Um, a number of questions came in about maybe other reasons for um, the findings. And this really applies to both of you because I think whether you're talking about causal uh, explanations for homicide or causal explanations for disparity, um, this is, can be very challenging, a very challenging area of study. Um, any thoughts between the two of you about whether or not you might see the same results post COVID uh, post Floyd, um, whether or not there had been, there were other things changing that led to increases, for example, Tom, that may not be related to uh, uh, deprosecution, as you argue, or OJ, some things that might uh, be contributing to the findings that you have with regards to disparity. Do I go first? Yes. Well, I don't know of any major changes other than the pandemic and, and the and the racial justice issues that you mentioned. 
some of our cases actually did extend into that period because they just took a long time to get resolved. So in my study, I don't see those as major factors to be dealt with. If I had started the study in 2020 and used 2020 data, that would be a major issue. But for our study, it, it wasn't a major issue as far as I can tell. And yeah, that's a great question because I want to address it in two ways. One is um, Philly was perfect because there didn't seem to be anything different in Philadelphia going on during this time period. So it really made it an ideal subject. And as I've talked to plenty of academics about this, they keep raising that specific question. And my response keeps being, yeah, I would accept a, a different causal route if you could come up with it. Please tell me what it is. And they keep going down things and knocking them out. And really in the absence of another explanation, such an extreme deprosecution regime, 70% lower sentencing across felonies and misdemeanors is really hard to ignore. Um, from a statistical standpoint, I think you'd be surprised if that didn't have a result uh, on homicides. On the other side of this, I think of the greatest natural experiment in the world, because what a lot of colleagues have told me is, well, to test this, you would really have to take a traditional regime and shock it with deprosecution, because your theory is that deprosecution at this level, felonies and misdemeanors, 70% reduction, would result in an increase in homicide in any city. I'm like, yeah, that's what the theory is. So we did that. 2020 and 2021 had major nationwide involuntary deprosecution. We probably saw prosecutions cut by 50% across the nation because courts were shut down. And what happened? 2020, we saw a over 29% spike in homicides, and it kept going up in 2021. Now, you can offer alternative causes there, obviously. George Floyd's murder, uh, people being shut in the whole time. But think about the logical steps you need to go through to get from, we locked everybody inside, so homicides increased, as opposed to, we couldn't lock people up anymore, we couldn't prosecute people anymore, so homicides increased. It was a genius natural experiment. And that's actually what I'm looking at right now is to try to figure out how did that play in 2020 and 2021. And the data that I'm, the initial data that I'm seeing is fascinating because the progressive cities like Philadelphia are seeing larger increases. It's like they started something on fire and now it's blowing up. Um, but we're seeing it across the board in even traditional cities. So it appears that deprosecution can have an effect just about anywhere. Thank you, Tom. Um, another question that was raised, and Dave, you might have some insight on this, um, is whether or not there's a forum to discuss the ethics of allowing voters to vote in self-interest for progressive prosecutions, low-level benefits, which then result in the 95% confidence of, of the death of others to achieve this effect, I'm sorry, I'm not sure exactly what that refers to, but in a liberal society, how is this acceptable without accountability? Isn't this just a sophisticated form of rollerball in which victims are scapegoated for the benefit of low-level criminals? I think there's a lot of politics involved in that question, but Dave, would you like to take that? Again, that, that seems to be kind of a bit of a wow question. So first, for those prosecutors that are elected, they have to run for office. And much like you're saying, they can make promises that if elected, I'm gonna do the following thing. Um, George Gascon, the LA district attorney has been mentioned a couple of times. He's been subject to two separate recalls and his consistent message is, is I said, this is what I'm gonna do. If elected, I'm gonna do the following things. I don't know about going to scapegoating victims I, I think that's a bit extreme, but to look and, and you started out with the ethics, ethics and responsibility. What is the ethical duty of a prosecutor? And in a general sense, the ethical duty is to, if there's a reasonable probability that a judge or a jury will return a verdict, then the, the, it is the, the ethical duty of the prosecutor to move forward. The however to that is, rather than, the, and we've used the phrase deep prosecute, ma many of this is diversion or alternatives, which is acknowledging that the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system doesn't work for everybody. And is there a better way? Is there a better pathway? 
to go at the root cause of the criminal action and, 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 and the criminal genics and, and fix it in that way. And that's why it's a little more complicated than just to say, well, it's ethics. You have a duty to, to proceed because when we do that, that gets us back into mandatory minimums, many, many legislative bills uh, uh, focusing on the role of the prosecutor and putting shall, you know, shall prosecute. Then we're just to case processing. We're not administers of justice. We're not looking at the bigger picture as to what is happening in our communities. And I look at what Tom said a little bit different. I think the access to justice is really key. And when you go back to the victims, were they heard? We are working with three jurisdictions right now on procedural justice, lots of victim surveys. The procedural justice aspects was more important than the case outcome for the victim. Were they respected? Were they heard? Were they informed of what was happening in the case? More important to victim satisfaction than whether they got a weekend, a month, or 10 years in prison. That, that, so, so, Cynthia, I think you have a lot there, but I think there's, there are reforms that are needed and necessary. And Tom talked about the, the effects of the pandemic. There are tremendous backlogs out there. And how can prosecutors do things better? Thank you, Dave. Um, we're, we're at the bewitching hour. Uh, Tom, a number of questions came in about a critique that was written on your paper by Kaplan et al. I believe they posted that publicly, uh, and you have posted your response publicly to that critique. Uh, so um, let me just say that uh, you're welcome to write to Mr. Hogan. He will point you to where those are publicly. Um, and so uh, I just want to say, did you, I wanted to ask because there's so many questions about that. Did you have any quick comments about it? Uh, they, uh, uh, one question came in that said they did not find an effect of deprosecution on homicide. And can you provide just a quick response, Tom? And I know you've, you've detailed this in your, in your response on paper. Sure. Uh, so the Kaplan critique starts out by reassembling the data and replicating the precise uh, the precise results of my original analysis. They then went through and did an augmented synthetic control analysis um, and claimed to have flipped the results. When I actually dug through the data, what I found was massive data errors. For instance, they said that New York, one of the major donor cities, cleared zero homicides for three years. Um, so once you fix the data errors and run the augmented synthetic controls, it results in the exact same result as the traditional synthetic controls, a large statistically significant increase in homicides. And I understand that they posted something new. Um, somebody has already told me that there is flawed data in it. All I can really say is at some point, fellas, the easiest way to get out of a hole is to put down the shovel you're digging it with. But I will look at it all and respond to it. Okay, thank you, uh, Tom. I, I guess I want to pose a final question to everybody. And, and again, my apologies, everyone. We've asked so many good questions, um, and many of them have been on specific aspects of the articles, uh, which um, I'm sure that the authors would be willing to uh, answer your questions um, outside of this forum. But the final question I want to pose came in through the chat, which was, what are everyone's thoughts on felony conviction sentences versus misdemeanor conviction sentences. Is the prosecution of felonies more likely to correlate with increases in crime versus the prosecution of misdemeanors? Has this been looked into? Um, and I guess this is a, there's a broader question at play here, which is the context in which um, uh, some of these uh, policies and practices occur. Um, does anybody want to take a final stab at this question? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, this is exactly the right focus of where everything should be. Um, if you prosecute what are violent and violent related felonies um, in a rigorous fashion, you can control crime. And you can, with misdemeanors, with nonviolent misdemeanors, you can lay off of them. You can have shorter supervisory periods, you can have diversion, you can get people mental health help, you can get them addiction help. That's a much better program than just massively incarcerating everybody. That is the specific balance that we are seeking. Um, but again, you can't move all in one direction or the other. 
it's that balance in between that we're always looking for. I'll just say quickly that the question almost pre assumes that the options are not to prosecute or to, as a felony or to uh, send it to, to misdemeanor court. There are a lot of things in between. And I, I think that's what, what uh, Dave was trying to get at. Just because a case isn't prosecuted as a felony doesn't mean it isn't handled in some way, perhaps outside the criminal justice system, perhaps treatment. There are a lot of different responses to a criminal offense. And I think it's problematic that we think about uh, these issues in terms of black and white prosecution, not prosecution. And Cynthia, I'll, I'll, uh, this is a great close. I'm gonna agree with both of my research colleagues. It is trying to get into that balance. What is the right reason? And getting back to individualized treatment. I mean, what what is the best? And there is a role for, for, for the court. There's a role for, for custodial uh, sentences but there's a lot of other roles for public health and housing and, and job uh, training and, and such uh, so that we have safer and better communities. You know, I, thank you, Dave, uh, and thank you, Tom and OJ, Chris, uh, for your insights. I, I wanna end just by with a comment and it's something that OJ mentioned um, early on and that both Tom and Dave alluded to. And I think the, the issue is for an academic or for research, from a research standpoint, is having really good information in which we can analyze to understand these things. The decision points at every single stage of the prosecution system or and the policing system, the, the transparency of that data, uh, the um, availability of it. Uh, OJ, you were talking about handwritten notes that you had to you know, transcribe and put them into your data. Um, in my view, I think that that is uh, also an important step towards our attempt to try to understand uh, what's, what is happening and some of the causal aspects, even though those are hard also to, to dig into because it involves many other pieces of data. But I just wanna end on that note because I think that um, within this debate is that very strong need for better, more fuller data um, at the prosecution level, at the courts level more generally. I would imagine that all of you would agree with me with that. Okay, well, we are now five minutes over and um, I think we should have did a three hour webinar uh, as opposed to an hour and 15 minutes, but I want to thank everybody, especially our audience for the wonderful questions that you all sent in. I'm so sorry we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, and to the panelists uh, uh, for their um, uh, just ability to explain some of these things to us who don't study prosecution and your willingness to give your time uh, to, to present in this forum. We hope this debate continues um, and uh, that we keep talking about this issue as we move forward. So thank you all. Uh, and I'm going to end the webinar now.